Okay, instead of news articles. No, no, don't worry, don't panic. I got something else for you. It, it ties into our study this evening. So let's pray and then we're gonna show you some video clips and then we'll get into Second Kings. Father, we thank you for this evening that you provided for us, Lord, to study your word. And Lord, as we have the opportunity to, to see some of what we'll be discussing this evening. Thank you, Lord, that you have preserved the land and that we can truly hold our Bible in one hand and a shovel in the other. And so, Father, may our hearts be stirred this evening as we continue through Hezekiah and his desire to have the nation be right before you. Yet, Lord, we see such difficulty, but we also see your power. So bless our time in the word tonight. Lord, help it to cause us to grow in our walk with you and be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Marianne, let's show clip number one. at the Jebusite city that David would capture and make his headquarters. In other words, Jerusalem. Next one, please. And this is what's underneath. Water is a rare resource in Israel and especially in Jerusalem. In the city of David, many cisterns were carved out to hold rainwater. Water cisterns that undoubtedly looked much like this one. One summer, about 2,600 years ago, Jerusalem's cisterns began to dry up. This was during the Babylonian siege of the city, and the prophet Jeremiah called on the citizens to surrender in God's name. But King Zedekiah's princes tried to silence the prophet, and they cast him into the pit. And in the pit, there was no water, only mud. In the city of David, even the pits have a story to tell. Sorry, we have an old version of Windows that wouldn't let us daisy chain it, so we have to kind of hunt and peck and then play them, so. In the city of David, great treasures are still hidden below the ground. One of the astonishing discoveries of recent years is this pool, which was carved out maybe 3,800 years ago. On your next visit here, you will already be able to stand at its bottom. Alongside the pool, the Canaanites built tremendous fortifications that protected it from the enemy. The pool was discovered there. The foundations of the fortifications here, and not far from here, modern steps go down to the Gihon Spring. But before we go down there, look at the surface of this rock. Perhaps it was in this very place that King Solomon was anointed. And they caused Solomon to ride upon King David's mule and brought him over the Gihon. And Sadok, the priest, took the horn of oil out of the tent and anointed Solomon. The city of David tunnels conceal fascinating stories about lost treasures. In the 19th century, 
This shaft was climbed by a British officer named Charles Warren. And it bears his name to this day, Warren's Shaft. After Warren, an adventurer called Parker came here to look for the temple treasures. But in fact, these tunnels led the early inhabitants of Jerusalem to another precious treasure, a fortified water pool carved out by the Gihon Spring. Did you hear the swords clashing? Some people believe that King David's soldiers climbed up these tunnels on their way to conquer the city. Perhaps 3,000 years ago, Yoav ben Suriah himself passed just here. National Park in just 90 seconds? Get ready. The tour starts now. It will take you three minutes to walk here from the Wailing Wall or just 30 seconds from the parking lot. The City of David is a small hill sloping from the foot of the Temple Mount down to the Silver Pool. It looks beautiful, but in the past it looked even more beautiful. At the City of David Visitor Center, you're invited to watch a realistic three-dimensional movie which portrays the city as it looked in the days of David and Solomon, Isaiah and Jeremiah. King David's palace and the Jebusite fall probably stood up there, above this huge supporting wall. The excavations are still underway up there, but we will move to another place, cooler and more mysterious. These are the tunnels of the Warrenshaft system carved out by the Canaanites. These may be the same tunnels that King David's soldiers used to conquer the city. Want to get your feet wet in the Gihon Spring? You will never forget the 20 minute walk in the tunnel or the amazing story of King Hezekiah who commissioned it. If you don't want to get your feet wet, take the Canaanite tunnel. Today, Hezekiah's tunnel ends here, at this pool. But a little way off, a large part of the Siloam pool of the Second pool Temple of Siloam was from John discovered 9. by chance. The city of David is continuously excavated, and new findings are constantly revealed. On our way back, we will pass by the first Jewish house that was built on the hill way back in 1873. The city of David has come full circle, and so has our tour. We are back at the entrance square. 3,000 years of history and adventures are waiting for you to be discovered. So, see you here soon. Okay, so the city of David, this is where Hezekiah is reigning, and they had the Canaanite tunnel, they called the Canaanite, if you heard them. Canaanite tunnel that was used. Remember when David took the city and the Jebusites mocked him saying, we can let the, you know, the blind and the lame guard the city. You'll never be able to get in here. Remember that from David? And so he said, whoever climbs up the shaft can be captain of the host. And it was Joab who did it. Well, they have these Canaanite tunnels they found, and there's shafts that would go up that they would use to try and obtain water. When Hezekiah knew that the Assyrians are coming and others, he would follow along that Canaanite tunnel and actually make a second tunnel of about 1,777 feet. And they started at two ends and chiseled by hand all the way until they finally met. And so what we'll read about this evening, you saw the tunnel of people going through their pants rolled up, the water about yay deep. That is that tunnel underneath the city of David. If you've been with us, you've actually, some have walked through the tunnel, some have seen the Canaanite tunnel, depending if they want it wet or dry. Uh, but that is where we go each year as one of our last stops before we come back to the States. We stop and spend time in the city of David and it is a very cool sight uh, to take in. So now we are in 2 Chronicles 17. Hopefully it'll help some things make sense. You can search those again on the web and enjoy them at home. And I couldn't find the whole film, unfortunately, so I had to take pieces and put it together. So that's why we had to keep doing the different segments. 
2 Kings 19. Okay, again, Lord, be with us and open your word. So Hezekiah's become king at the age of about 25. That was chapter 18. His father Ahaz, a bad king, had done a lot of damage to the temple, to the worship of God. 25 years old, Hezekiah takes over. He begins to restore the temple, restore worship. They broke down the high places. The people were getting right. In fact, they decided to hold a Passover, and since they had been defiled, it was a month late, but there was a provision for that given in the law. And so they invited the northern tribes, come on down, we're going to have the Passover. And the messengers from Hezekiah went up through the north and told the people, come back to the Lord your God and come seek the Lord. And some did, but others mocked them, made fun of them, scorned them, and sent them back. And so Hezekiah, there's this revival that begins to break out as they begin again to worship the Lord and to get right. And as these things are happening, Shennacherib comes in the 14th year of Hezekiah, chapter 18, verse 13. And Hezekiah had rebelled against the, the oppression that had put on them. And so here Hezekiah would take from the gold and take things from the temple to try and pay them off. And rather than disappear... Verse 17, the king of Assyria sent Tartan, Rabseris, and Rabshakeh from Laish to King Hezekiah, and they came up to the fuller's field, and they began to say loudly, Speak now to Hezekiah, thus saith the king, the great king of Assyria. What confidence is this wherein you trust? Saying, I have counsel and strength for war. Whom do you trust that you should rebel against me? You're trusting the staff of this bruised reed, even Egypt, with him a man will lean on it. It will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all that trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, verse 22, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away? And by the way, that was part of revival. And has said the Jude in Jerusalem, we shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now, therefore, I pray, give pledges to my lord, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can set riders on them. Which of you can turn away the face of one captain of my master's servants? And so have I come to this place without the Lord to destroy it? For the Lord has said to me, go up to this land and destroy it. And so then Hezekiah's cabinet there said, listen, we know the Syrian language. Speak to us in that tongue. And Rabshakeh got even louder and said, has my master sent me just to speak to your master, but not to all these men that sit on the wall that will drink their own urine and eat their own dung during the siege? And so Rabshakeh said with a loud voice, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will not be able to deliver you. Neither let him make you trust in the Lord, saying the Lord will surely deliver us, for this city will not be delivered but into the hand of the king of Assyria. So don't hearken to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me, come out to me, and every man can eat of his own fig tree and vine and drink of his own waters until I come and deport you. It's <laughs> a nice way to say it. Really. Move you to another land like unto your own. Have any of the gods of the other nations delivered them at all out of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath or Arpad or Sepharim or Hena or Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? And who are all the gods of these countries that have delivered their country out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people kept silent and answered him not a word. And so Eliakim and Hilkiah and Shebna the scribe and Joah and Esaph the, scri the recorder came to Hezekiah with their clothes rent. What does that mean? It was really bad. All he has to do is take one look at him. How do, ooh, that bad, huh? And so they began to report to him what happened. So chapter 19, it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard these things. Now he has revived the nation, restored the temple. Worship again is being properly serviced before the Lord. The sacrifice is restored, Passover restored, people getting excited about God. Good things are happening. It's been a long time since we've had a good king like Hezekiah. Well, then he should be trial free, shouldn't he? You mean you can be doing a lot of things right with God and still have trials? How many know the answer? Three or four, oh, and more of you than ever. Wow. Wow. Hezekiah, when he heard it, ripped his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Very interesting. Chapter 19, verse 1. Bad news. The Assyrians say we're next. 
They reminded us that they've swept all the other nations. None of their gods can defeat them. They have defeated all other gods. What makes you think your God is any different? And they're going to come through and take us out. This is bad news indeed. And notice where Hezekiah goes. He went where? To the house of the Lord. You know, there's a real difference between those who love God and those who don't. Those who love God, when great trials come, you'll find them running to the Lord. But those who don't often love God or other things are more important, you'll find them running to other sources of comfort. For example, Hezekiah runs to the house of the Lord. Yet how many people do you know run to the corner bar? Hezekiah, when deep trouble has come, runs even closer to God, runs in the house of the Lord, and begins to pour out his need before him. So then sent... Eliakim. He sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah. First mention of Isaiah outside of his book. Here as we go through the kings. Sent him to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz. And by the way, you can follow in chapter 37 of Isaiah for some of the same information. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This is a day, a day of trouble, a day of rebuke, Blasphemy against God, for the children are come to birth, and there's not strength to bring forth. Now, having been through labor, or at least, let me correct that, having watched from the side labor ten times, that's a horrible place to be where now it's, it's time, and the mother's exhausted. Everybody's in jeopardy at that point. That's a very graphic picture, coming to birth, and there's no strength to bring forth. We're exhausted. It may be that the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach, notice the real subject, the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. You see, Hezekiah has already suffered some defeats. 46, 46 cities or villages had already fallen. Some 200,000 had been taken captive already by previous attacks of the Assyrians. But Jerusalem thus far has been left untouched. But the Assyrians have come in and done some real damage there in the areas around in Hezekiah's kingdom. And so they're in real trouble. Perhaps he will reprove the words which the Lord thy God has heard. Lift up your prayer for the remnant that are left. And so the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto him, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid. Why is that the first thing he said? He's afraid. 200,000 already have been deported of the areas of Judah. 46 cities taken, villages. Don't be afraid. By the way, would he have heard that in a bar? He would have heard, I have another, right? Or last call. But among the godly, instead, he heard, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the words which thou hast heard. By the way, listen, if you're thinking, well, he's really slamming people who are going to bars. That was me 25 years ago. I was going through grad school, drinking all the time. And when I got really stressed, I'd go down to Isla's bar at Front Street and do shots. And I was drinking kaopectate and malox and a mess, and, and God interrupted. What a difference. Don't be afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me, the Lord said. This is the real issue. Behold, I will send a blast upon him. <laughs> he shall hear a rumor, you'll see, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. That's a prophecy. We'll see if it gets fulfilled. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And the king had heard say of Terhathka, king of Ethiopia, behold, he's come out to fight against you. There's the rumor. Ethiopia is coming up from, from Africa, along with perhaps picking up the Egyptians. They're coming to fight against you, King Sennacherib. You better get busy. He heard this rumor. The king has come out to fight against you. And so now Sennacherib sent messengers again unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, the king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Wait a second. Do you know what the attack is? How can you trust God's word? That's the attack. 
Hezekiah is in trouble. He's told that the Assyrians are going to come invade them. They're going to finish them off. They're going to wipe them out. So you better make peace with us now. Come out. We'll take you away captive, deport you out of your land, send you to a land like unto the one you have now. And if you don't agree to that, we are going to come and we're going to wipe you out. And then the repeated attack is do not let the king deceive you when he tells you you should trust in God, saying you will not be delivered into the hands of Assyria. He is attacking the word of God. What does the enemy often use to shake your faith? As God said. True? And sometimes people come along and say, well, how, how can you trust a book written by men thousands of years ago? Well, the answer is holy men of God wrote the things as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And here we can dig up the pool there on the Gihon. We can dig up Hezekiah's tunnel. We can dig up the pool of Siloam. We can dig up the Gihon there on the right side of that city, as you saw going around the little circle where they took Solomon and they dedicated and anointed him king with Zadok, Zadok, the priest there. We can see all these things. We can read them here and you can go to the land and it's right in front of you, right where it says it should be. The interesting thing is they, they can't dig a highway or even a latrine in Israel without hitting a historical site. There's evidence everywhere that it all matches up with the word that's sitting in your lap today. Absolutely, you can trust the word of God. And the more they've tried to destroy it, for thousands of years they've tried to destroy it, and yet they don't have a single verse that defeats the word of God by itself, that shows that clearly this must have been some figment of someone's imagination. Not one verse they can use to destroy its credibility, and they have tried for thousands of years. Interesting. Don't let them tell you to trust in the Lord your God. What an attack. By the way, why is this second attack of psychological operations going against Hezekiah. Because if the rumor is true and they're coming up from Ethiopia and grabbing the, the Egyptians, then the Assyrians need to hurry up and mop up Jerusalem because they don't want to be busy sieging Jerusalem when they got to deal with this new threat from the south. So what Sennacherib is doing is realizing this rumor is coming and saying in his mind it must be true. He is trying to use as much intimidation as possible to get Hezekiah to capitulate so that he won't have to deal with Jerusalem and instead he can go and deal with the problem in the south. So seeing the bigger picture, he's trying to force Hezekiah to cave in. And that's why there's repeated pressure now coming with this second round of messengers saying to him, thus shall you speak to Hezekiah. Let not your God in whom you trust, verse 10, deceive you, saying Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Let me break it down for you this way. Behold, you've heard what the kings, plural, of Assyria have done to all the lands. Tiglath Pileser the third, Shalmaneser, Sagan the second, and now Sennacherib. You've heard what they've done to all the lands by destroying them utterly. You think you're going to be delivered? You think you're going to get out of this and escape? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed as Gozan and Haran and Rebza and Re Rezef? And the children of Eden, which were in Thelassar? Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sepharim, of Hena and Iva? Where are all they? And Hezekiah received this letter of the hand of the messengers, and he read it. I love this. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord and said, It's for you, Lord. <laughs> Mail call. Question, why would he go and spread it before the Lord in the Lord's house? What does he expect? Why would you do that? You notice he didn't read it for him. Lord, listen up. Let me tell you. Just, it's for you, Lord. It's his faith. God, this isn't my battle. This is your battle. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God, verse 15 of Israel, thou which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, you are the God, even you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. And by the way, Isaiah, if you get into chapter 44, really through 47, 48, there Isaiah, remember, he's mentioned at this time 
there he's prophesying, saying, you, you Israelis, what are you thinking? You people of Judah, you go out in the woods and you cut down a tree and you take part of it and you make an idol and you take part of it and you heat your place and take part of it and use it for other things. And so as you warm yourself by the fire, you fall down to this idol. That part of it's in the fire, part of it's in your apartment, and you cry out to it saying, save me. And there God gives an amazing series of instruction. I am the Lord, there is no other. You will know I am God because I will tell you the end from the beginning. Go to your idols and ask them to tell you the future and declare it if they can. They have eyes they can't see and mouths they can't speak, ears they can't hear, feet they can't move. And God gives this scathing rebuke of idolatry, which is what they had fallen into. Powerful section of Isaiah where God tells us he is the only one who knows the future and he alone is God and there is no other. Hezekiah knew this. You are God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down your ear and hear. Lord, open thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he hath sent to reproach you, the living God. Of a truth, Lord, Hezekiah is letting him know the deal. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations in their lands. Why? They've cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods. They were the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore have they destroyed them. They had no power. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand. Why? that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, even you only. This is about your name, your word, and your glory, God. They're mocking you. Then Isaiah the son of Amoz sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, have I heard. Wouldn't that be an encouragement? Okay, here's a test. How many have prayed about something? How many have ever been to school? How many have ever had tests? Then you've all prayed. <laughs> oh God, when did we learn this? How many have had the privilege or had the privilege of praying about something and seen God answer it? How many more than one time? Well, then he's heard you too, hasn't he? And the first thing he heard was, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me my sins. Please, Lord, forgive me. And suddenly the Holy Spirit took up residence within your heart through your faith in Jesus. And everything began to change because you actually finally, from your heart, cried out to God. God heard you, and forgave you and put a new nature within you by the Spirit, and took you from the kingdom of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of life. And now he's beginning that lifelong process of where he's pulling the darkness out of your light, out of your life, and seeking to put you more and more into the light. And as God's word works in your heart, and as you're more into the light, the light reveals more things that need to come out of your life. But it's that process of sanctification where you cried out to the Lord, he heard you, and now he's conforming you, he's changing you, and making you more like his son. Some days it's good. Some days it's painful. But he heard you. What a great encouragement in prayer. If you've never done this, prayer requests, you print them out, you, you pray over them, and then you find God answering. Great, praise God. And just to go back and, yo, look at this, look at this, here, here. And it's an encouragement to continue to pray. God hears us. Go tell Hezekiah, I have heard him. I've heard the things that you've prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria. So verse 21, now this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. I got an answer for him. I wonder if this was written down and sent back, return to sender. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Hold on, let me translate. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> that's it. If you need help with that, that's it, basically. Ain't going to happen, buddy. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? 
Against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lift up thine eyes on high? Even against the Holy One of Israel. Pop quiz. 27 times Hezekiah uses, Hezekiah, Isaiah uses that term, the Holy One of Israel. Interesting, only used outside of Isaiah. Uh, let me make sure I get the right number. Five times. 27 times in Isaiah. Out of the rest of the Old Testament scriptures, only five times. Three in Psalms, two in Jeremiah. Why would Isaiah be someone who would favor that term, the Holy One of Israel? Who's got it? Okay, keep your finger here. Turn right to Isaiah chapter 6. If you've never seen this before, you are getting some of Isaiah's experience infused into this text. Chapter 6 of Isaiah, And the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and above it stood seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And they cried one to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Anybody want to guess now why Isaiah used that statement over and over? Because he saw the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and it changed him for a lifetime. Interesting. So that was a little aside. Back to our text. Who have you lifted up your eyes against, even the Holy One of Israel? By thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord. And has said with the multitude of thy chariots, am I come up to the height of the mountains and to the sides of Lebanon and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof and the choice fir trees thereof. And I will enter into the lodgings of his borders and into the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk strange waters with the sole of my feet. Have I dried up all the rivers of besieged places? Hast thou not long ago heard how I have done it? And aren't the ancient times that I have formed it don't you know? Didn't you hear? Now I, God takes credit, brought it to pass that should that thou shouldest be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. Didn't you know the only reason you've been successful is because I've allowed it? And it was being used to fulfill God's purposes, like judgment against Samaria. Did you realize that God knew their intents and their wickedness and God allowed it? He could have easily restrained it. You are simply an implement of my judgment. It wasn't about you, and it wasn't your power. I was the one that brought it to pass, that you should lay fenced cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore, because of this, verse 26, their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and as the green herb and as the grass of the housetops. They withered when they saw you, as the corn blasted before it be grown up. I know thy abode. I know you're going out and you're coming in. Eat your heart out, NSA. Just a thought. I know your rage against me. Nothing was hid from God. And because thy rage against me and thy tumult has come up into mine ears, therefore I will put my hook in thy nose. Why would he say that? Uh, you see, when the Assyrians would capture a town, the way they would transport people is they'd tie your, they'd rip your arms behind your back, tie them together, put a hook through your nose, tie it to the guy ahead of him with a string, the hook through his nose, and you'd be led along with hooks in your nose with your hands tied behind your backs wherever they wanted to take you. They also do it to large animals. If you have farm experience, you get treated like you're a dumb ox. I will put my hook in your nose my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which thou camest. And this, Hezekiah, shall be a sign unto thee. You shall eat this year of such things as grow themselves, whatever has been planted, it will be enough to survive and sustain you. And in the second year, that which springeth of the same. It appears it was year six. The following year would be year seven when they're to let the land rest. Then would come year eight or the beginning of a new seven-year cycle. So God says, here's a sign to you. What's out there in the fields, that will be enough to sustain you this year and for the next year so you don't have to sow. And in the third year shall you sow and you will be around to reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. And the remnant that's escaped out of the house of Judah 
shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward, for out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, that they escape out of Mount Zion. They that escape out of Mount Zion. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, number one. He shall not shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield, nor cast a bank against it. And that would be they cast up ramparts, then they get their siege engines up, and they beat the upper section of the wall because the lower foundation is the strongest. And so one of the ways to breach walls is build a ramp up against it, start beating in the middle or the top half of it, and you can start breaking them apart and then breach the wall. He's not going to do any of these things. Won't shoot an arrow, won't heap up ramps against it for besieging it, not even a shield. But by the way he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. Well, how's this going to happen? For I will defend this city to save it, not because they're such a great people and they've been so right with God. I will save it for my own sake. Why? Because they've been blaspheming the God of Israel. You see, Rabshakeh really messed up when he made it between Sennacherib and the God of Israel. Because when he called out the God of Israel, the God of Israel is going to defend his name. By the way, we're going to see that again in the future. Israel today is not yet in the right state where they ought to be as far as there's a lot of issues going on. They're quite secular. But there's going to be revival. There's going to be an invasion that's again going to come from Persia, which is Iran, from Libya, from Turkey, from Russia, from some other areas as well around them. And they're going to seek to invade and God himself is going to shut them down. And only one fifth of those invading armies will return. Five, six or one sixth, five, six will be wiped out. And Israel's going to realize, as we've read from that article in the Iron Dome, God's fighting for them, not because of them, but because of his name. So we are going to see this again in the relatively near future. I will defend this city and save it for my own sake. Uh, okay. When he told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. How many understand that clearly? Is that clear? Then why are portions of the church today through replacement theology, which is they believe the church has replaced Israel, God is finished with Israel, there are portions of the church today taking their investments out of companies like Caterpillar because Caterpillar does business with Israel. What's going to happen to those churches? They're not seeking to bless Israel. In fact, they've lobbied at times the Congress to withdraw support of Israel. Churches, so-called followers of Christ and his word. Crazy. I will defend this city and save it for my own sake. I will save it for my servant David's sake. And so it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and eighty 5,000, 100, four score and 5,000, 185,000 in one night. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Do you remember they were there in the garden at Gethsemane? Judas came up to Jesus and he began to kiss him, master, master. And Jesus said, Judas, do you betray the son of man with a kiss? The reason he kissed him is so that those who were with him would know who to arrest. And they quickly went to seize Jesus and one of the disciples, and we want to guess? Peter pulled out his sword, cut off the right ear of Malchus. And Jesus said, Peter, put up your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. But he said, do you not know that I could call to my heavenly father and he would send more than 12 legions of angels. At that time, there was discussion about what's a legion. Some say 3,000, some say it had changed to 6,000. If it's 3,000 angels per legion, 12 of them, and each can kill 185,000 men, you're at about 6 billion, 600 million people that could be killed, which is about the population of the earth. If it's 12 legions of angels with 6,000 per legion, that would be 13.7 billion 
potential killing power, which would be twice the current population of the earth. Was he in any trouble? More than 12 legions of angels. Oh, okay, so what's the big deal? What are you getting at? Nobody took his life from him. He laid it down for you and for me. He willingly surrendered so that the Lord could lay on him the iniquity of us all and the wrath that we were due. He willingly took our place. And that's just after he finished sweating drops of blood, knowing what the cup would entail. 185,000 smoked in one night by one angel. Wow. So when they rose early in the morning, everybody's dead. Well, so Shennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. I wonder if he left Rabshakeh alive. I wonder if one of the guys said, hey, big mouth, what do you think now? Turn to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Right hand turn. Psalm 46. There are several psalms that go along with this, but let's just focus on 46. It's a psalm of trust and thanksgiving that focuses on the God of Israel. Many believe it is written at the time that Sennacherib, during the reign of Hezekiah, was defeated. Some have gone as far as to say perhaps even Isaiah himself coined it. But here is Psalm 46. Our God is a refuge and a strength and a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. Think about that. Meditate on it. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Yeah, how about like when they blew the wake-up call? The heathen raged. They were outside making fun of them. The kingdoms were moved, many of them defeated. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Think about that one. Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease. Yeah, one way is turn off the army. Until the ends of the earth, he breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. You've heard this many times. Now you know the context. Be still and know that I am God. That's where it was found. There was no way they could deliver themselves. And this is when that scripture came. By the way, do you know where the joy of the Lord is your strength comes from? Nehemiah 8, chapter 8, verse 8. Around that section there, they have finally come back from being in captivity. They begin to read the law and give the sense, essentially expository teaching to the people. Revival breaks out, but as they hear the word of God and what it really says to them about their heart and their condition and their behavior, they begin to weep and sob. And that's when they said, hold on, hold on. The joy of the Lord is your strength. This is a good day. We're coming back to God. Cheer up. At least you're listening. That's where that one comes from. Be still. Know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the heathen, I'll say. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Pause or Selah. Think about that. So back to our chapter. Behold, in the morning, they were all dead corpses. So Shennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, went and returned and dwelled at Nineveh. As prophesied, he'd leave. And look at this. Came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrach, his God having come off this tour of blaspheming Israel's God, that Adremelech, or Dremamelech, and Sharezer, his sons, killed him, smote him with the sword in the house of his God, 
Interesting. So Israel's God can present, protect and preserve Israel, Jerusalem in particular, from a massive army. And Sennacherib's God can't even protect him in his own house of worship. Is there a message? Yes, there is. His own sons rose up and killed him, as prophesied by Isaiah back there. Verse 32, verse 28, we got these things. They smote him with the sword. They escaped in the land of Armenia. And Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, if that was, how many would say, wow, that was an amazing trial? Now, here's the rest of the story. Chapter 20, verse 1. In those days, as this was happening... Hezekiah was sick unto death. Many aren't, you know, they talk about what would the timing be? Well, they came to him and they told him about the first round of blasphemy when Rabshakeh was there and you're going to eat your own dung and drink your own urine. And Hezekiah ripped his clothes, went into the house of the Lord. And then they sent the letter back later and he took the letter into the house of the Lord. So Hezekiah was well enough at those times to come before the Lord. So it seems perhaps after the second threat, Hezekiah fell ill with what was a terminal illness. Well, how do you know that? Read the chapter. In those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord God, set thine house in order. What does that mean? Prepare your succession plan, for thou shalt die and not live. Ooh. But wait a minute. Time out, Pastor. I thought his dad was a wicked king and he's a good king. True. I thought he tore down the high places and helped Israel to get back to a right worship of God. True. His zeal for God and his zeal for the word, if you read those chapters in Chronicles I gave you for homework, even rebuked the priesthood and the Levites to get their act together so that they could be right. The Levites were more ready than the priests, but that's beside the point. And they held Passover and there was a revival. People stayed for seven days. They were so moved. They stayed for seven more days and just there was, God was happening. All true. Well, then why is he going through trials? Because that's also part of life, isn't it? Could we say, well, he's sick because of his sin? Well, we could say that about all of us, right? Because the wages of sin is death. We all deserve death because Adam and Eve sinned. We've all inherited it. We're all sinners. How can you say that? Because you've all lied about something. You've all stolen something, whether it was candy from grandma or whatever. You've all, you know, coveted things. Face it. You've all broken the commandments. So that makes me a sinner? No. That proves you're a sinner. You were born a sinner. And you prove it by sinning. So why are these things happening? There are times, if we're not careful, that we will become Job's counselors. Someone is sick. Someone has got just, they're getting the, you know, the stuffing beat out of them in the world, so to speak. Everything looks like it's going wrong. And if you're not careful, you might get the mentality of, well, you know, something must be going on with them because, you know, this wouldn't happen if they were right with God. Oh, really? Was that the case in Job? Was it because of Job's sin, as all his counselors were saying? It was a test that Job, unfortunately, had very little knowledge of. Perhaps until maybe after the fact. We just covered this on Tuesday morning, Tuesday morning tune-up. We're in 2 Corinthians 1, talking about the comfort you receive from God in your trials. God will then allow you to use to comfort others. And that's often why we go through trials. Sometimes it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with the people around us. And in that chapter, Paul said it got so bad at times that he despaired even of life. And that's Paul, who was seeking to serve God with all that he had, beaten with rods, you know, three times, 39 stripes, five times, shipwrecked three times, all the other things that happened to him. That man was serious about sharing the gospel of Christ. And yet he had great trials and afflictions. So much so that he said, a great door is open for us at Ephesus, but there are many adversaries. So throughout all that's happening here with the Assyrians and the blasphemy of God, Hezekiah has this sickness. And Isaiah shows up and says, listen, buddy, bad news. This is going to take you out. You better get your house in order. Prepare the succession plan. The reason why is he doesn't have a son yet. And so let's pick up what Hezekiah did. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, apparently bedridden, prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beg you, I beseech you, O Lord, 
Remember now how I've walked before you in truth and with a perfect heart. Could you say that? You study Hezekiah, he really was trying to do what's right. And I've done that which was good in your sight, also true. And he wept sore. Some argue he was weeping because he he wants to keep living. It's good to be the king. Others say he's weeping because the nation is just finally starting to get right with God again. Finally starting to enjoy God's presence and God's blessing and deliverance and promise of his working again among them compared to the dark time that Judah went through with Ahaz and other kings. We only know when we get to heaven. But he was so broken, he began to weep before the Lord. Lord, I tried to serve you. Why? It came to pass before Isaiah was gone out to the middle court, having left his discussion with Hezekiah, that the word of the Lord came to him again, saying, Turn around, divine new turn. Turn again. Tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, title used for David. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. And behold, I will heal you on the third day. You shall go up unto the house of the Lord. Wow. So God changed his mind? This is where it starts getting sticky. He is omniscient. Omniscient. Omni, everything. Niscient. This is to know. Omniscient. Means he knows everything. So he knew the request would come, didn't he? If you're not sure, read Jeremiah chapter 1. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and I ordained you to be a prophet. Boy, that's a pretty good career path. Not even conceived, and God's got a path for you. God knew, but it was also a test of Hezekiah. Go tell him I'll heal him on the third day, and that he'll go up into the house of the Lord, having been restored. And I will add to thy days 15 years. That's great until you hit year 14. Could you imagine? You went in today, and, and I know the medical community at times, if you're in great sickness, may tell you you only have so many months. And again, we've learned over the years that that's a guess. But could you imagine if you heard, you have 15 years from tonight, and you'll be dead? For many of you, you'd be like, okay, I'm going to make some different choices. Better start saving for retirement. Wait a minute, if I'm dead, I don't have retirement. Let's see. But it's 15 years. That's so far away. I mean, think 15 years ago. What was it? It was 1999. Hairdos, clothing. (gasps) Bad flashback. (laughs) What if you were told you had 10 years? Boy, that's a little closer. That's 2004. What if you had told you had five years? Ooh, that was 2009. That whole financial mess was still going on. It still is. What if you told you had one year from tonight? Maybe I better get serious about serving God because I'm going to see him. You want to know the real truth? The only thing you can say with certainty is that right now you have what appears to be of what's left of tonight. Because none of you can guarantee you'll see tomorrow morning. We've done funerals. We had one last night for somebody, 86-year-old George Gruen. Remember him? Sweet old guy who taught for me while I was away about ministering to the Jews, and suddenly God took him home. He was supposed to teach while we were in Israel, but God had other plans. 86 years old, on fire, served the Lord right to his death. We've also done funeral for babies that weren't a year old. We've done funerals for a three-year-old boy that ran out back and had a defect no one knew about. We've done funerals for kids, teens, 20s, 30s, turned off in the middle of the night, not sure why, still never knew, nothing came back from toxicologies or anything, no idea. So you can't sit here and say, well, I got years to go yet because the actuaries say, that's great, but the only thing you can count on is you have tonight. 
And tonight, you're here, and you're here in this room. Whether you know Jesus or not, you're here. And the truth of the matter is, there is a God. He tells us the end from the beginning. He is the only Savior, and the only way for a man or a woman to be right before God and see him in his presence, like Isaiah in chapter 6, to see the Lord and be accepted of him, you must come through the blood sacrifice he has made, and that is through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You ask by faith for him to forgive you. God will apply that blood atonement to your account. You are made righteous before him, and you have been adopted as a son or a daughter into the family of God. And should you die tonight, having received Jesus as your Savior, you will be allowed then to enter into his presence, because you can only come to the Father through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except through faith in him. And you have tonight. And who knows how soon before the Lord removes his church. And then your time to store up treasure in heaven will be over. It would be hard to know you have 15 years. But if we get serious and get real here for a minute, should the Lord tarry, I'm willing to guarantee there are quite a few of you here that may not be here in 15 years. And it may not be the people who look at, yeah, he's got some white hair, she's got some white hair. Oh no, it may not be them. Maybe you, bang, because you're on the phone when you'd be driving, or you're messing with things that really are quite dangerous. Just a thought. I'll add to your days 15 years. I'll deliver you in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. See, it hadn't happened yet. So sometime during all this of chapter 19, verse 35, When the Lord showed up and in the middle of the night they all died, Hezekiah got sick. We're not exactly sure, but with all that's going on, suddenly he's fighting for his life as well as fighting for the city and for the people. I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And so Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. And they took, this was a common use of a modality in those days, and they laid it on the boil and he recovered. Isn't that interesting? God promised to heal him, yet they still used a common, readily available modality or way of treating him. There's all kinds of ideas about what was it. We'll get to heaven, we'll find out. Whatever it is, it was not comfy. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, well, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me? Very simple, day four. (laughs) Sorry, that's my own idea there. Third day, you'll go up and worship anyway. What would be the sign? I had people one time, oh, one guy sent me this email about the, the rapture's going to be, I didn't say this. Somebody sent me an email, the rapture's going to be on this date in October, whatever the year was. And he gave me this whole email. What do you think? I said, ask me on October 6th. <laughs> oh, he didn't like that. I got an even longer email. <laughs> October 7th, I sent him an email. How you doing? I got a short answer. Go away. (laughs) Try to reach out and what do you get? (laughs) What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? Day four, what else? And Isaiah said, this is the sign that thou shalt have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees on a sundial or go back 10 degrees? Hezekiah answered, some say two steps. It could have been a staircase. We'll ask him to get to heaven. Hezekiah answered, you know, it's a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. Really? Nay, let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. So in other words, you've got options. Rotate the planet backwards, refract light, or something else. Any of the above would be super Natural, that is above what normally occurs in nature. Everybody got that? So which is it? No clue. That's why you get to heaven. We don't just play harp all day. So what'd you do with that whole sundial thing? I'll check this out. Let me show you. Wow, that is cool. The prophet Isaiah, when he heard this, cried unto the Lord, and the Lord brought the shadow 10 degrees backward, which it had gone down in the dial or the sundial of Ahaz. Mm. Nope. Let's stand. Let's pray. We'll pick it up there next week. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, we thank you for how you worked in Hezekiah's life. 
Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Lord, there are a lot of questions we have from this life and even from your word that we don't always understand why you orchestrated things in the way that you did. But I'm sure there were many watching Hezekiah through this trial that perhaps finally got serious with you because of his testimony. Lord, we pray for our own country. Our God is being blasphemed around the world. There are those who are completely opposed to your people Israel and the people of your book, Lord, who believe in Jesus. And they have made it their stated objective, Lord, to come all the way to this country and try to shake those who believe on you. Lord, we remind you of their words against Israel, against the West that honors Christ, and those countries around them, like even in Iraq, the Christians who are fleeing for their lives. They've made this battle between their God and our God. And we know who the true and living God is. Lord, show yourself. Help your people, those in prison and those fleeing, and even those in this country just afraid to take a stand for what's right. May we not be afraid in these last days. May we not deny your name. May we keep your word. May we have a little strength from the Holy Spirit that you might keep us from the hour of trial that is going to test those who dwell upon the earth. Work in us, Lord, tonight, we pray afresh, and touch anyone here that doesn't know you. Let tonight be the night that they finally receive you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving us so deeply. In Jesus' name, amen.